Carla, when I look out across the sea here, I see a beautiful example of the natural world, but what you see is a problem. Actually, the ocean are suffering of a lot of problems, such as pollution of plastics, uh, but they also have some problems that we see, but we don't see at all. One of it is ocean acidification. So basically, 30% of SO2 that humans are emitting are absorbed naturally by the ocean. But unfortunately, the ocean is getting acid because of it. It's 30% more acid than it was before the industrial revolution. 30%. Ocean acidification. It's the hidden side effect of our carbon intensive world. The ocean's natural ability to absorb carbon has guaranteed life on Earth, creating ideal conditions for the tiny marine organisms at the base of the food chain to thrive. But the oceans are reaching their limit. The more carbon we emit, the more acidic the ocean becomes. And this shift is triggering a ripple effect with serious, far-reaching consequences. Before we go any further, let's just pause for some basic science. Acidity is measured using the pH scale, which ranges from 0 to 14. Anything from 0 to 6 is considered acidic. 7 is neutral, like pure water, and 8 to 14 means a solution is alkaline, or base, basically the opposite of acidic. This stretch of Sicilian coastline is home to one of Europe's largest petrochemical hubs. For decades, carbon emissions from facilities like these have made the ocean here more acidic. Other hazardous pollutants have also been linked to a negative impact on human health, earning this area the ominous nickname of the Triangle of Death. You may have seen here that there are a lot of petrochemical factories, a lot of uh, really hard to abate uh, industries. And people want a revolution, a green revolution. Most experts agree we're unlikely to cut emissions fast enough to meet our climate targets. So now, one option on the table is to capture the carbon dioxide we emit and store it permanently. So we came up with this idea of LimeNet, uh, so to try to industrialize a natural process that is the geological carbon cycle in which naturally CO2 is captured by a rock, that is limestone, that is one of the most available rock material on planet Earth, that were, is able basically to capture CO2 naturally and then to store it here in the ocean in a permanent way. Geological carbon cycling also known as the slow carbon cycle, is how carbon moves between the Earth's atmosphere, rocks and the oceans over millions of years. Here's how it works. Carbon dioxide mixes with rainwater to form carbonic acid, or H2CO3, which slowly breaks down rocks. This releases bicarbonate, calcium and other ions, which flow through rivers, eventually reaching the ocean. Here, the calcium and bicarbonate ions remain stable in the sea, locking carbon away for thousands of years. LimeNet's plan is to accelerate this natural process, and this in turn will reduce the ocean's acidity, or put simply, will make it more alkaline. So to increase the alkalinity of the ocean in order to restore the pH, so the capability basically of the ocean to have minerals dissolved, and so the capability to really have like a buffering, like what you, what you take when you have a, a stomachache, uh, that you suffer of acidity of stomach, you take some minerals, and that is carbonate or bicarbonate, that yeah. basically buffer your acidity. The same is what we really need to do in the ocean. And to do that, Stefano and the team at LimeNet want to use one of the Earth's most abundant materials. To showcase their plan, they've partnered with the Leone La Ferla Quarry in Sicily. The La Ferla family has been working here for generations. 
Wow, this is vast. How big is this size? It's 120 meters wide, 80 meters deep, and 350 meters on the other side. It's absolutely huge. What is it that you're extracting here? Limestone. That's actually our raw materials for producing quicklime and all other products that comes after. Quicklime, or calcium oxide, is a key ingredient in many industrial processes, from construction and steel making to water treatment. It's also a valuable tool in agriculture, where it's used to reduce soil acidity. And it's this neutralising power that LimeNet plans to tap into. But the company says it will change the way it's made, making the production less carbon intensive. And as a bonus, use it to capture even more carbon. So this is an example of the limestone that you've extracted and that you will use in the LimeNet process? Correct. So what stage of the process is this for you? So the first stage is again to take it, to smash it, to mill it, in order to have a really fine material from a big rock. LimeNet Kiln is able to calcine this fine material. This one. this one here. It's just like sand, yeah. It's like sand. And uh, basically, 30-40% of all the limestone produced here uh, is too small to be calcined, and so it's considered as a waste. That's a huge amount of what you're producing that's going yeah. to waste. And this is actually like a worldwide problem. Everyone that produces lime with a modern kiln, actually, because our is last technology of killing, still have this much waste. And that waste would be exactly what you need for lime there. Correct. So what can we hear happening here? This is actually our kiln, and this is where the limestone is cooked and transforms into quicklime. To make quicklime, limestone is heated in a huge kiln at temperatures of up to 1,000 degrees Celsius in a process called calcination. I'm just thinking that when you first walk onto this site and you know, as an outsider, uh -huh. seeing what's happening here, hearing about what's happening here, my first thought is this is really carbon intensive. Calcination transforms limestone that CaCO3 into quicklime, or CaO. But in the process, it releases one molecule of carbon in the form of CO2 back into the atmosphere. In Europe alone, 18.2 million tonnes of quicklime is produced each year, releasing roughly 10 million tonnes of CO2. LimeNet's electric kiln will change that. Instead, it will run on renewable energy, and the CO2 produced during calcination will be captured. The next step in the LimeNet process is the hydration of lime, turning the quicklime, or calcium oxide, into calcium hydroxide, also known as slaked lime. So here we have an example of hydration of lime. We power some uh, calcium oxide that comes from the calciner. So this white powder, we put in this glass. And then we pour it up some water. The hydration is, is starting. And you can see some uh, vapor. So there is an exothermic reaction of this material. So that's really fizzing up, and you can see this vapor coming off it. That's actually hot to the touch now. Yeah, yeah it's hot wow. there. This reaction can generate enough heat to boil water. LimeNet plans to use this heat to preheat the limestone before calcination. But the major bonus of slaked lime is it's much more reactive and easily absorbs carbon dioxide from the air. And what you're doing with LimeNet, you've talked already about mimicking um, the natural chemical process. So this would happen in, in nature naturally? Actually not in nature, because this is a really uh, something that happened in the laboratory and industrial process. So this is a way how we are able to speed up uh, this process to produce calcium bicarbonate at the end. 
All of this will come together here at Sicily's Port of Augusta, where LimeNet plans to construct its first modular reactor in early 2026. The traditional kiln will be replaced by an electric kiln that both calcines limestone and hydrates it into slaked lime. Half of the slaked lime will become green lime, which can either be used to absorb CO2 from the atmosphere or sold on the market to substitute lime produced by fossil fuels. The other 50% will be mixed with seawater and the carbon captured during calcination to create the key ingredient, calcium bicarbonate. For now, a temporary plant has been built to trial the technology, one of the largest facilities of its kind in the world. Here we have a big pump that pumps water inside these long pipes. After the injection of seawater, carbon dioxide enters here and the carbon dioxide we are using comes from a biogas upgrading plant. Until their final reactor is up and running, LimeNet is using biogenic CO2 to represent the carbon they'll capture during calcination. After that, we have the injection of calcium hydroxide in a form of slurry, so a liquid solution containing calcium hydroxide that later reacts with seawater and CO2. OK, and then the exciting stuff happens through here. What happens here? From here, uh, it starts the reaction between uh, CO2, carbon dioxide, and the calcium hydroxide. We have these two big reactors where the reaction takes place in around four minutes. It's super fast and uh, nature normally takes thousands of years to do this, this reaction. So you're turbocharging what yeah. nature does over millennia. Yeah. Once this solution has worked its way through the reactors, what does that final product look like? The final product is the same as seawater. It's transparent with the same pH and it only has a higher amount of bicarbonates inside of it. So it's scientifically proven that calcium bicarbonate can stay in the ocean for more than 10,000 years because it's a chemistry equilibrium. So as soon as calcium bicarbonate goes in the ocean, it's like salt dissolved into your pot when you, when you are cooking your pasta. So it's the same as the ocean. So as soon as the ocean has this chemistry, calcium bicarbonate can stay for more than 10,000 years. Injecting calcium bicarbonate into the ocean increases the alkalinity, indirectly counteracting ocean acidification. But carbonates are also used by tiny marine creatures to build their shells. To study this, Controlled pool trials were carried out in collaboration with the Polytechnic University of Milan and the University of Milano B. Coca to see how different levels of calcium bicarbonate affect marine life. What we saw is incredibly good. So it means that when you, when you increase a little bit the alkalinity in this big swimming pool, basically the palanton is living better. What does it mean? It means that they grow a little bit more because uh, they have more food, more chemical material that can use in order to grow their shells better, in order to reproduce better. So these trials show there is the potential for LimeNet's idea to benefit the ocean ecosystem. But the big question is, can this idea really make a meaningful dent in global carbon emissions? So, all the processes that capture CO2 from the atmosphere or produce net zero product can really have a global impact on the atmosphere. Because if we remove CO2 here in Sicily, in South Italy, but also we remove CO2 in New York, it's the same. However, when you do a removal of CO2 contracting ocean acidification, we have also a local impact. For instance, uh, this process uh, uh, that takes uh, uh, up CO2 and takes up seawater and then they process it in order to alkalinize it, then when you inject it into this port, you have uh, a localized impact. It's like to have a river that goes here in, in that area. So that river uh, will affect positively that part of the sea. Then you have dilution of the ocean because you have currents, you have tides, etc. So this uh, a positive impact goes distributed uh, 
in wet areas. So this kind of processes could be considered as a global positive outcome for the atmosphere and a more localized outcome for the ocean alkalinization. To fully cancel out our carbon emissions, we need to capture and store nearly 20 billion tonnes of carbon each year. LimeNet's temporary plant can store up to 800 tonnes per year. Like all big ideas, they first have to prove it works on an industrial level and then figure out how to scale up. But they say their advantage is working with nature, not against it, for the solution. Of course, it's just a drop in the ocean. It's really small. But this is a way how we are able to prove at industrial scale that it's possible to store CO2 in a permanent way in the ocean. Actually, the ocean basically is 70% of our surface of the Earth. The ocean can store hundreds of billions of tons of CO2, more than what we emitted so far. And fortunately, limestone is 7% of the Earth's crust. And uh, right now we are uh, digging from the earth uh, roughly, let's say, three gigatons uh, of limestone yearly. So if we are just double the production of limestone, we would be able to remove more than one billion tons of CO2 using limelight. So we believe uh, that uh, if this process could be scaled up, uh, it's really feasible to think uh, to reverse climate change using the ocean. The logistics of removing carbon on a scale that would mitigate climate change is mind-boggling. But if we think of the Industrial Revolution which started this crisis and the size of economies today, it's not really out of the question. But an effort on that scale will need the cooperation and will of governments and investors to get behind legitimate and sustainable carbon removal projects. And there's no time to waste because it's not just the planet we're trying to save, it's ourselves. <laughs>